Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back after a week off. Uh, and uh, yes, so today is our, what episode is this? 74 episodes. Our next episode will be 75. If you add the school round table, it'll actually be 100. So wow, great to spend time with all of you. Hopefully you have some light bulb moments today. Uh, remember, money isn't the most important thing in life, but it is like oxygen on the gotta have it scale. Uh, I'm from CUNITY. Uh, we're here to help you become more prosperous and to create a clear path uh, and get through the confusion, the complexity, the overwhelm uh, to a clear path for financial success for you and your teams. Um, old rules are complicated, text heavy and theoretical, and we think we bring an approach that's simple visual and actionable. Uh, remember to prosper, uh, manage your ATM. Uh, this is our fresh way of looking at return on investment, uh, looking at our three currencies in life, attention, time, and money. Money's not the only currency, and we do appreciate and want to use this moment to thank you for spending your precious time with us this week and uh, for all of you that uh, join us uh, every week. And for those of you that are listening to this on YouTube, we appreciate you. Uh, our last guests two weeks ago were uh, Jen Martinelli and Jen Groover. We had a great conversation as it related to human capital uh, and just other things that um, are really important for all of us right now. Great session. Listen to it on YouTube if you can. Uh, it's also in the Plan for Profits portal. Uh, this week, uh, we get to bring in uh, Janine Letford. Um, uh, lots to share with you about Janine. Uh, I recently had met Janine at the Serious Business Conference in uh, January in New Orleans, and I'll share a little bit more about her um, and our meeting and what we're going to talk about in a little bit. But I'm super excited and very grateful that Janine has agreed to uh, join us today. Um, she will be joining our Brain Trust, uh, which is a bunch of you uh, who have given your precious um, attention and time by being guests. Uh, and shared light bulb moments for all of us. And speaking of light bulb moments, uh, be sure to join us on Sunday, May 15th in Janine's hometown, sort of hometown. I think she's in Phoenix, but we're going to be in Scottsdale. But uh, certainly do join us for a celebration of light bulb moments on May 15th. We're going to be honoring all members of our brain trust, including Janine. Uh, and you are all invited to join us not only for the Sunday evening celebration, which will be a Beauty Changes Lives fundraiser, but also the Phil Conference, our first annual Phil Conference. We're going to help you fill the gaps in your business, how to better execute, profit, grow, lead, and engage. Um, and also to fill your bucket by getting away and um, making sure that you are replenished so that you as a leader can go back to your business and your family and life um, with new energy. So registration is open. If you haven't registered yet, you should because we are under an early bird registration. Um, and the link is fillbycunity.com. You can also go to our webpage and on the very top, there's a link to uh, sign up. So uh, now uh, we, uh, this is the second round table where we have invited members of the school community to join us. We have several of you with us today, so thank you. Uh, and uh, again, looking for some light bulb moments today. I've got a few things I want to start out with. So these are uh, uh, top of mind for Tom. And I've got a few. All of them uh, really come from uh, a, a something I subscribe to, and it's called uh, um, Emmy site. And uh, let me uh, take you through just a couple points that might uh, stimulate some thinking and stimulate uh, your brain here a little bit. So this has to do with the unexpected. And, um, and the author of this, uh, who is Amy Kasser, uh, talked about being on the road and being asked all the time when it comes down, uh, asked um, what's coming down the road with uh, the economy and interest rates. He said his answer is all the same if he knew he'd be on a beach in Mexico having a good time. Uh, he does talk about something that's very much stimulated to me. And so what can each of us do? Well, and I'm going to read verbatim here. First, stop trying to predict the unpredictable instead of shoring up our balance sheets to prepare for the, um, uh, prepare for the unexpected. So, all right, so stop trying to predict and just shore up your balance sheets. You should have reserves and a line of credit in place to deal with unknown emergencies as well as the flexibility 
to jump on opportunities that all uncertainty invariably will create. That's thought number one. Are you prepared for the unexpected? Um, are you building reserves on your balance sheet? Are you ready not only for um, bad times, but also good times? Are you uh, meaning, are you able to take advantage of opportunities if they come up? The next thing that really relates to um, something I want to share with you is something about what is an evergreen company. And he quotes Dave Wharton, um, uh, Wharton, excuse me, who's an entrepreneur and venture capitalist who founded something called the Tugboat Institute. And that's to connect, uh, connect support, and inspire purpose-driven leaders of evergreen businesses. All right, what is an evergreen business by his terminology? It's a, a term used to describe business owners building companies they hope will last forever. Gosh, how many of you want to be part of companies that will last forever? Isn't that like the ultimate dream that the company will outlive you? Um, these companies have avoided uh, venture capital and private equity because they want to stay independent, private company. These companies didn't want to be put in a timeline to be sold or go public, which was in direct contrast to what he saw in the venture capitalist model. Instead of solely focusing on value and money, um, these companies would always uh, start by talking about culture, employees, customers, and purpose. That very much resonates with me too. Um, so these companies are not successful by Main Street Society, um, um, who were doing things differently and proud of what they were doing. Some of these companies have been around for hundreds of years, continue to be successful. Uh, and so one of the things that is a lesson also from the pandemic is diversification um, and how diversification, what that can mean geographically, expanding your product line and services. So that's thought number two was about Evergreen Company. And lastly, it's about the great resignation. I would love to get some comments on these three ideas. Three ideas really being, are you prepared for the unexpected? Uh, what's an Evergreen Company? And the great uh, resignation. So let's go to the great resignation. He says, the great resignation is not an excuse. Um, and he was talking about talking to a friend of his and, um, and he said that everything had to do with the great resignation. Uh, suggested the issue was a macro issue and nothing to do with his leadership or what was happening in his company. And he says, not so fast. The great resignation is real, but means you have to work twice as hard on culture and taking care of your team and people. You can't hide behind the great resignation or use it as an excuse. Do the work. Any comments on those three areas I just shared with you guys? To me, they resonated and it's um, uh, resonated. I know so many of you and, and I thought you would find those to be helpful. Um, all right, so I'm going to bring Janine here in a moment, and I want to frame this as it relates to a conversation that we've been having uh, about financial literacy. And um, financial literacy is very, very top of mind for us as we've launched our student version of financial literacy, and we'll soon be launching the Money Pro version, um, which will be uh, allow employers to be an employer of choice by providing financial wellness to members of their team. It's a big idea, we're super excited about it. And uh, basically the curriculum we have for the students is updated for professionals with several new twists and other value adds. And a great segue into our conversation with Janine is money mindset. And mindset, we cover various things for and not or. In other words, um, breaking the myth of either or Instead, um, it's about and. You can be great at your craft and uh, make great money. Uh, you can be great at your craft and have money skills. Uh, and a lot of creative professionals don't see it that way. There's this myth of the starving artist for one. And so some of the things that we cover are money myths. There's so many money myths. Like number one is like, I just want to do hair. I mean, you know, that I'll be successful if I just focus on my craft or uh, avoiding it will make it go away. I mean, there's, there's eight money myths. Knowing your why is so important. I know Aaron shared that at the same event that Janine was speaking at and the importance of really understanding your money why. And then finally, money stories, which I felt was a really good segue into the conversation I'm having with Janine because even though she doesn't speak, um, even though she um, doesn't necessarily speak specifically about money stories, actually I shouldn't say that she probably does, but um, uh, I know we're going to get into money story. So anyway, Janine, let's let me uh, stop the share. 
And let's have you come on camera here and let's uh, have the opportunity to say hi. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm wonderful. Glad to be here. I assume it's uh, uh, sunny and warm down there. A little bit cloudy. It might rain today, so I'm, I'm okay. We love the rain. It brings life and freshness, so we're, we're good. You know, uh, life is about moments, and uh, mm -hmm. you and I had a moment at Serious Business, and uh, I actually did not get to go to any breakouts, any main stage. <laughs> I was so wrapped up in other stuff that we we're doing at the event, and but I heard such great things about your, um, uh, your presentation. And our moment is you literally were just sitting there, you were sitting on a, a chair. Uh, I think you had your bags there. Uh, I was leaving for the airport. You were on your way out and, and I introduced myself to you and said, sorry, I missed your presentation. I'm sure it was awesome, <laughs> I heard great things. And here we are today. Um, and it's just the importance of little moments where people can meet each other. And then I invited you to be a guest on the round table. So shout out to you and thank you for indulging me in that moment and for joining us today. Well, life is a series of moments. And when you talk about creativity and our journeys financially and otherwise, when you look back, it's about the building of the moment. So I'm so glad you brought that up. So you, your topics range um, into a variety of different areas. You've written books. Uh, you've written a book <laughs> called From Debt to Destiny, um, uh, The Seven Gems of Intercultural Creativity. You actually sent me the books. I looked through them. Thank you very much. It's awesome. And your serious business, business presentation and a lot of the focus right now is about intercultural creativity, which we will cover. And, but also given our topic, I'm super intrigued with the work you've done with financial literacy too. Mm -hmm. And um, now you're, you've done, um, you've written books, you're an educator, um, uh, you've done TED Talks and all of that. So creativity and finance is just two things that really have connected with me throughout my career. And now when you talk about creativity, you know, um, you really talk about problem solving. So let's start with creativity and merge our way into finance, okay? Sure, sure. Well, because I'm an educator, I'm all about definitions because we come to the table with different concepts and cultural lenses. So I can say one word and it can mean one thing to you and can something completely different to me depending on our lived experiences. So creativity, a lot of people think it's only art, artistry, right? And, you know, and we have um, a lot of great art, art artists on the call now, but creativity is so much more. It involves artistic, you know, thinking and development and creation. But creativity, I had to redefine it for my research research and I said that creativity is a process of problem finding and problem solving with relevance value and novelty so people who are highly creative they're not just waiting for like leaders to, or bosses to put things in their lap they're out there they're being curious they're observant of their surroundings and interesting phenomena and they're asking questions and they're, they're driven by curiosity to find out and they're problem solvers they're looking at unique ways to produce, to solve, and just to say, well, well, why are people doing it this way? Why can't we do it that way? And so that's how I want to basically redefine creativity and make sure people know that it's for all of us. It's in all fields. All If you are a human with a heart and a brain, uh, you are highly creative. And there's some other animals and species that are you know, highly creative. I, I believe we're all highly creative in the way that we're supposed to be. And Go ahead and define, uh, because you mentioned definitions and words are important, and I, I agree mm -hmm. with that. So define intercultural creativity. Sure. Well, my work, first, I was, my work was fascinating. I was big on financial literacy. And if you see my, my TED Talk in 2017, and uh, the book that I wrote about my husband and I getting out of $100,000 worth of debt on a teacher's salary and no financial literacy at all, that was a big thing. And then I looked at creativity and my artistic background. But then I realized, you know, going in, into the workforce and even within the classroom, if you're in an uh, organization or a culture that is either toxic or maybe not even just toxic, maybe just neglect, like no one's paying attention to anyone, people are kind of left out, 
that really does a number on the way you see yourself creatively and the way you see the creative, the creative potential of others. And so my background's in psychology and education and human development. And then I say I have a street degree in neuroscience because I, I bring a lot, lot of brain research to this. But I realize I can go to your org, org, organization or someone's organization and teach creative thinking all day long. But if the organization itself is in a place of you know, in inclusion and the DEI work isn't being done, it doesn't matter what I come to do and to train. It's not people aren't going to be able to utilize their creative potential if they're not in an org, org, organization of inclusiveness. So that's where the intercultural part came in. Cultural competence is your ability to observe with complexity uh, similarities and differences of other people with different lived backgrounds. You know, there's people who are very good. They can connect with any type of people, no matter where they go. Those people are normally highly culturally competent. And my work talks about how it's a developmental process. So there's some people who just because of their formative years, uh, how their parents or caretakers raise them, they're just really observant and keen on connecting with people with different lived experiences. And there's some people who may not have had a lot of exposure. They may have not have traveled a lot or you know their caretakers just really excluded anyone different from from them and so you have adults who have that that um that existence that cultural lens because of their formative years so because my background is a lot in formative years work i i do i bring that into the workforce now in telling people we have to do a lot of reflective work because the way we grew up affects the way that we interact now and that is intercultural creativity yeah, it's a great definition and seems very real and um, and actionable too. And I, I think what you do is you bring certain things that create sort of a continuum to get you to that point, you know, different gems. I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, and this was definitely a mind shift. And when we did our prep call, um, you talked about creativity is also problem finding. And a lot of times um, that's a shift for me mentally, because when I'm sort of in the problem finding, um, you know, it's sort of that critical thinking part of my brain, you know, so talk about find problem finding, and how that relates to creativity and and it, it, it connected some dots for me so. Sure, it's connected to curiosity as well. And there's two main types of, of journeys that people go when they're they're doing this type there's something called divergent thinking and then there's convergent thinking and so if i say you know uh, um tom what's two 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 plus two you're going to automatically say what I, i'm hoping i'm going to say four yes four and and let's say there's other people in the, in the, the class you know and you say four and i say yes tom and so i'm basically converging everyone to that answer but what if your daughter said well 10 minus six and what if your friend said the square root of 16? You know, there's multiple ways to get there. And that's what we want our, our team members and our students to start really understanding. And sadly, I, I do say because I taught in the school system that I can apologize on behalf of the school system. We train you to think convergently. And so by the time you graduate 12th grade or if you go on a high, higher ed or trade school, you, you now are thinking in that main way. And now the workforce needs you to think divergently as well. There is a space for convergent thinking. It's very important, you know, for, for, for you to come in, but we have to start divergently. And so that's where that problem finding comes in of, of sitting down. And you mentioned in your, op your opening talk, the importance of replenishing like for your, your, your conference. And I don't want that to be a passing point because the neuroscience shows that if you're looking for problem finding, you have to turn off your focus network and turn on your innovation network. The official term is your um, your default your default mode net network. And basically, that's when you're daydreaming. That's when you're in a new place. You're just letting thoughts go and giving yourself the time to do that is so important because that's when your subconscious starts making connections that you weren't making when you were in your focus net network. And so take, taking time to like going to your conference or, or taking walks or looking for time to let your brain kind of shut down a li little bit, you're actually working. You're just not focused on the working. Your subconscious and your innovation network is doing a lot of, of the working. And you'll find a lot of problems kind of come to you and you'll see patterns. You'll see unusual connections and you say, well, hmm well, why isn't my salon doing it this way? What about this? That comes during your innovation network time, during that, that um, problem finding time when you're not intentionally trying to find problems, you're letting your subconscious do a lot, lot of that network. 
Yeah, I, you know, we, when we were prepping for this call, we just, I said, you know, my job is just to do what I do anyway, and that's remain <laughs> super curious, you know. I'm curious, how do you shut off? Um, how, how, mm -hmm. what, what, because everybody's different. And I, I want to share with you something related to space in a moment here, physical space. But what about you, Janine? I mean, you tell us a little bit about you and how you open up your space for, for, you know, creativity, et cetera. Sure. It, it's, it's an intentional thing now because I, I will admit, you know, I'm, I don't say I'm a workaholic, but I love to work. I love to produce, you know, I'm, I'm the person in, in class and then working and then watching lectures and, you know, with 10 color pens and, you know, all of my notes and everything. But um, my husband first brought this into the home because he was an, an entrepreneur when I was teaching full time. And he was like, I just have to stop on Saturday. Like I can't do any work on Saturday. And I was like, oh, okay. But then uh, 2020, when the, right before the pandemic started, I was just like, you know, bro, I'm going to introduce the concept of a Sabbath, you know, whether you connect it to, to faith or, or just, you just stop or not. But yeah, Friday night, everything's down, no work until sat Saturday night. And it's just time for my family. It's time I just sit and journal. That's one thing. Journaling is really important. If you look at the top leaders today, you'll see a lot of them have that journaling time and a lot of them have that sit and turn on my innovation network time. And journaling is important because if you see one of my gyms, perspective shifting is one of the gyms, your ability to perspective shift and get out of your position and get it either in the position of someone else, of something else, right, who you're serving or the products you're, you're, you're trying to, to um, share. And journaling allows you to look at a situation from not your first person view. And so like if you journal like, um, like a birthday party or a wedding, it, it's funny when you watch the video of your wedding, you're like, wait, that happened? that happened, that person was there, right? Because when you're in that experience, you're you're so concerned with what's going on, you're missing like 20 things around you. But when you look at the video, you're able to see it from a new perspective. So journaling does that. So I journal, I take uh, my Sabbath and I take walks. I really believe in walks and sometimes walks with leaving the phone at home. Anything that that gets your innovation back into a fo focus, you're losing that time and then your brain has to kind of get back into there. So walking without your phone and walking with my three year old who's just turned four. Mm. Ch children have a way of showing you what you're you're missing sometimes and, or, and animals, dogs, you know, if you're walking with a dog or or. I don't know, a monkey or whatever type of pet you have, you have at home, they, they have a way of, of noticing and observing things that you might be missing. So that's some, something to, to keep in mind. You know, I, I probably should have asked this question, but I didn't realize you had a three-year-old. Um, you have a, you have a three-year-old. Um, tell us a little bit more about your family, if that's okay. Uh, Sure. And I would love to. And I think it's an important thing to bring up. So thank you for asking that. Because when we think about creativity, when we think about financial literacy, when we think about our money stories, it's not just us living in a vacuum, right? We have all these influences around us. So, you know, growing up, I'm, I'm a twin to four, four, four kids, single parent home. Mom didn't know too much about money besides paying the bills, um, you know, and paying uh, Rob, Rob and Peter to pay Paul, you know, that type of <laughs> lifestyle. So, uh, but very, she worked very hard and she created a home of intercultural creativity, but we didn't understand investing. There was no financial literacy in the home or in school, which once again, I, on behalf of the school system, I have to apologize because that's a that's not just a omission of the curriculum. That's an injustice to our peop our people, all all all, all of us. Hold on, uh, so who's gathering the light bulb moments there? Um, <laughs> because it's uh, the word injustice really just I, it's really fascinating. You say that word. I do believe it is an injustice um, to not teach financial literacy in the schools. And, um, but keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt you. And I just thought about this this morning. I was thinking who wins? Cause that's my question, right? There, there's a curiosity aspect of, of me going deeper. Who wins here? If I keep pumping out millions of people who are financially literate yet who get bombarded with advertisements as early as the age of, you know, one and two, three, four. And if you learn, which I do have props because I am an uh, elementary school teacher by, by heart. So I have a lot of manipulatives, but if you learn what, how the subconscious mind works and how identity works, if you're bombarding me with advertisements telling me I'm not worthy unless I have your product and then I have no financial literacy, 
who wins when I become a working a, a, adult? So I'm just going to leave that question with, with you, <laughs> for you. But so I, I just grew up in that, in that um, household, but no financial literacy, uh, went to university, got university debt, got credit card debt right away because I didn't even know how to calculate interest. I didn't know how to credit cards work. I was so happy. I bought all this stuff and only had $15 a month of a payment. What is this plan? I love it. Had no clue what I was doing to my financial make makeup. And then I uh, got married and my husband and I realized we were in $100,000 worth of debt. And then I saw a book in my library called Fin Total Money Makeover by a person named Dave Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And I and and I went to it and I was like, well, what is this? My aunt gave it to me. I just stuck, stuck it in the, the library and left, left there for like three months. I opened it and I was floored. I finished it in like a day and I was floored. I said, wait, I'm a UCLA graduate and I think I, I know a few things and I don't know this basic information. And it wasn't like it was rocket scientists. My brother works for NASA. He worked on the Mars 2020 project. He sent, he, he's a rocket scientist. <laughs> this is not rocket scientist, or a science. And so I, I, was, I was floored. I just remember crying. And if you watch my TED talk, I start with that story. I remember just crying because I lost so much time because I didn't have this book at 17 years old. And so that was the beginning of the journey. And that's why I was very just fanatic about financial literacy, because Maya Angelou says, when you learn, teach, and when you get, give. So if I know something now, and so I, I, I started doing um, just many classes at my church. I, I started a nonprofit called Alumni 360, where the graduates of my elementary school came back once a month. I brought in, you know, speakers like like you and and other people who just have these stories and financial people, entrepreneurship pe uh, people, and just people thinking creatively with building something of purpose, but also have that financial aspect. Because I knew that okay, I didn't get this information until 30, but they're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Let's 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 try to fix this. Let's just do what I can. And so Alumni 360 was what I started. And then um, I did the, the TED Talk. And then um, my husband and I on on you, YouTube, you 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 can find it, Janine Let Let for Debt Free or something. You watch me paying off my last student loan. <laughs> mm. You know, yes. yeah, you know, we've we've studied all the works of Dave Ramsey. I mean, we've we we have a library of all the financial literacy books out there, and each one has their um, mm -hmm. their different points of difference. And you know, for us, we're really looking at a, a creative workforce um, mm -hmm. and yeah. very visual visual learners, you know, and that that's really a big piece to us is how we can make it super simple and visual question for you. So why should an employer care if their uh, employees are financially literate? Why, I've actually why, done why, why, why? Because there could be a mindset that, oh, if we teach financial literacy, they might go off and work on their own. Now, one of the things going on in the beauty industry is there's different options to to interface in the workforce. Um, our audience is primarily made up of employee-based businesses. And many of them are losing talents to people go independent. And part of the reason to go independent is they don't have all the facts. They don't have the facts of starting their own business. Um, what, you know, now they're gonna have to book all their appointments. There's tax changes and all that. So, but <laughs> if, if as an employer, why should we care about the financial literacy of our team? Sure. And uh, there's there's two parts to that question. Number one, the, the benefits of being a part of a team base. You know, um, there's so much so many benefits creatively there that we can def definitely touch on. But the financial part is and there's actually research out there about this because I work with the mindset and the, psych the psychological aspect, the stresses and the strains on a person's life right that um is huge especially when there's a financial term turmoil number one it, it's it's the the number one cause of divorce um you know suicide rates ha have been attached to it you know there has been been that as well and if you just look at just the metabolic cost to that to think creatively and to reach out interculturally there's a cost the brain there's it's a term called allostasis and the brain basically has to keep you running and keep you alive that that's the brain's number one focus right make sure you're breathing your heart's beating and all those things that you're not focused on is is, hap is happening so the brain needs to know where to send energy to do this 
when you are asked to think creatively and when you're asked to meet someone from a different lived experience where you can't predict what's going to happen, that's an extra, extra metabolic cost. So your brain has to gear up to know that it can send this cost out, out, right? And so that's why wellness and programs are important, eating right, exercising, and, and so on and so forth. And so if your brain is using energy, stressing, worrying about the uncertainty of finances, that is metabolic energy that is not being used to produce and to be creative and to even show up with, with a good um, you know, mental and emotional balance there. And so the research is clear and I can send you our articles about the correlation between productivity and the financial literacy skill of employees. And there's actually, there's employers bringing in financial consultants and, and educators and programs like yours because they see the correlation. And then if you add on the pandemic, the pandemic was an eye opener on a lot of fronts for a lot of things, but people started asking questions. Why don't I understand money? Like what, why is this missing? And I'm so glad, I'm, I'm sad that it took a pandemic to really get people to focus on that, but I'm glad that we're talking about it now because we can start the work in pre-K, kindergarten, so by the time they get to you, they'll be, be sound. Yeah, well, listen, words well spoken, and um, you know, certainly the data that we see also is overwhelming about um, uh, when someone's stressed about finances, uh, it kills cre creativity and productivity. And, uh, you know, you're, you're only using part of your capacity. You use terminology that's more science related. At the end of the day that, you know, that type of weight on your shoulders affects your ability to do great work, you know. Um, and, you know, that this, this really speaks to us as a team because we've really, really dug even deeper into the impact um, of what this actually can make on an industry. Uh, if we're able to pick an industry that has um, so many members of it, professional beauty and wellness, and keep in mind all the members of beauty and wellness that touch other humans. So creating that ripple effect is really hugely important to us, which is one of the reasons I wanted to spend time with you today. I want to talk to you about space for a moment. It, it came up, it came to my mind about 10 minutes ago. And um, I also believe, you know, you talked about sort of making space mentally, um, you know, your, your shutdown on Friday, um, you're sort of, you're fasting from um, being indulged in all the stuff going in and creating space and walks, spend time with your family. And I also believe where you are physically makes a big difference. And I just made a little bit of a shift here. We, we, we have, our company was actually born in a design studio. Um, um, we were, we the phrase designed to align, use visual communication to teach. And uh, we, we've been moving our space around the last couple of years and uh, we were, you know, in the city and moved out elsewhere. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm just turned into be long winded, which is a very simple point. I just redesigned my space and I have two spaces. I have one space that's more of an office and that's where I'm, um, I'm doing things, I'm in meetings, I'm whatever. And then I needed more of a studio. And um, my basement is very, I'm used to being in a, in a design studio where you've got countertop, you're able to lay stuff out. So creating and curriculum work and all that. So to me, space is very important, physical space. And you can kind of switch on and switch off a certain function. So anyway, I don't know where we go with that topic, but it just it just came top of mind when I was talking. Remember, we were going to be in the moment and be curious. So, yes, well, I can certainly back you up, sir, and bring in the neuroscience behind this and the personal stories. If, if, if people are listening on this call, remember your kindergarten space. Does anyone remember their kindergarten space? Or if you have a child and you recently saw a kindergarten classroom, how is that space different than the 12th grade classroom? Think about that. So when you're in kindergarten, you know, you have movable desks, you have manipulatives, you have things on the wall. Uh, you, have, you have different sounds, you have music sounds and you have uh, different play areas, just, just so many things to interact. And there's so many things that are inter interacting with your multiple, sense, their, your multiple senses. You have things you can smell, you can touch, you can see, and even snack time, right? Things you can taste. But when you get to a high school classroom or 12th grade classroom, there's like maybe one thing on the wall, like the rules or whatever, you know, there or maybe like what poster of Gandhi or something. Uh, and there's the desks are usually straight in rows, sometimes bolted to the floor. 
and I remember going to a high school um, to do a, a small talk and I was like, what? Wait, they're still humans. Why don't they get the same beauty of learning that our kindergartners get? And that really, there's your curiosity, that really forced me to problem find. And so there is a term called neuroscience aesthetics, right? You know, the term aesthetics, which is very a word that I can always misspell, but it's a, it's a fascinating word, right? And seeking the beauty in, in things and usually found in the arts, but just the beauty of, of things around you can be found in nature. And we were looking at the brain's effect of aesthetics. And so in the education world, we call it having a print rich classroom. And when I was working in like a cubicle, you know, right out of college, people would come into my cubicle and be like, Janine, I just love being here. It's like I'm in your home because I would decorate my cubicle because in that, at that time, I didn't have the neuroscience to back it up, but I just knew intuitively my space affects and influences the way that I think and the way that I function and the way that I interact with pe people. Now we have to have the brain science to, to back it up. And so when you're engaging in aesthetics and you're intentional about the space where you're creating, uh, you're, you're able to curate, cur cur curate it, right? I call it cur curating for creativity. And so people you know, who put things up on the walls, be mindful that even though you're typing and whatever you're doing, your subconscious is taking everything in. Audily, um, auditorily, visually, smell-wise, smell is the only, only sense that goes straight to your, your brain, right? There's no other gateways. That's why if you smell a certain scent, like memories come rushing back so quick, quick quickly. And so just be mindful. And this is, a, and I think that's a great question because as people really think about their creative connections to their entrepreneurs' pursuits and their financial pursuits, being mindful of the space that you're creating in your, in your workplace, but also in, in your home. You know, I'll, I'll be redecorating. We just moved to Phoenix about three months ago, and I've been waiting to put up pictures because I've been thinking, well, what are the right pictures? What what What's the story that I want to tell? Your space, Tom, is telling a story about where you are in life. If you remember your room when you were 15, right, it, it probably doesn't look too much like the room now because you were in, in, at a different place in life there. Tom, at a, as a 15-year-old, is has matured and developed than Tom at a 31-year-old. Like like now, right? You're third thirty one, right? Like, <laughs> oh, tar oh, stop! It. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you said something that just uh, this is going to be a light bulb moment. Everybody, be ready for this one, and it relates to the beauty industry. But before I do that, we have Carol Augusta joining us today uh, ah, on the call. So one of my favorite hi. people. I ah, hurt, but there's another point: social contagion. The people who you surround yourself is a part of you curating your space. Mm -hmm. So when you're around a person like Carol, you feel the joy and just the, the, the vibrancy of life, you know, on the opposite end, if you're around a person who's just, you know, negative all the time, like social contagion is real brains talk to other brains without you even knowing what's going on. And so as you develop your space, develop the people who are in your space. And Carol is a one amazing person who you want to put in your space. Yeah, well, she's been in my space for a long time. What do we see here? I can't resist seeing. I, I'll read her. I'll read it later. But anyway, <laughs> shout out to Carol, because um, that's really where this introduction came from. And I think it's always important to give credit when an introduction is made. So thank you, Carol. I'll read your text a little bit later. Here's what you said, you know, about the beauty industry. Touch their hair, you touch their heart. All right. Do you want to expand on that one? Sure. Uh, uh, touch, touch their hair, you touch their heart. So first of all, I knew I was speaking to your in industry. So even though I come from education and I do a lot of corporate work and, you know, and uh, PR and other, other, and, and healthcare, I was like, how did I end up in healthcare? And now I'm like, how did I end up in the beauty industry? But it's great. I'm doing a lot of key keynotes with different and trainings with, with people that I met at Serious Business. But in my research of who I'm speaking to, it's like, if I'm speaking to the beauty industry and people who aesthetically and physically have contact, they have to understand what's going on on, on, the, on the brain le level. And when you are um, touching someone's skin or, or massaging someone's um, uh, you know, scalp, it produces a hormone called oxytocin, if you know your, your brain um, 
elements. And oxytocin is the same hormone that's produced when a mother is nursing her baby. It's the brains working on connecting, right? Um, a baby has to connect with the mother because the mother is, is, in, is in charge of the baby or, or the caretaker because um, you can bot bottle feed and it's same things that happens as well. And so once I learn about what's being produced when when salon specialists are, are, are helping their, their guests, I, I just automatically you had that metaphor, that picture in, in mind. So just like a caretaker is connecting with, with the, to the child, um, the salon specialist has the opportunity if they choose to, to engage, right? Because um, there's always a choice. They have that opportunity to make that connection. So I wanted to really communicate with the serious business audience, their amazing audience. I met some brilliant, very creative people. The amount of influence they have over the people that they interact with. And I feel that that's another area that we don't do a good job in as far as the K-12 system of understanding how emotion, emotional intelligence plays in a life well lived. So there's financial literacy, creative literacy, and emotional literacy that I believe we need to step it up in, in the K-22 experience to make sure our workforce is tooled with the actual things that really, really could make the difference. You, um, you talked about beauty, the ultimate connector. Um, uh, Mel, uh, Malcolm Gladwell actually, uh, Gladwell actually mentioned that in his book. And um, now, one of the things there's for our audience today, we have members of um, uh, salons and spas, and then we also have schools. Um, so we have uh, members of the school business that are, you know, cosmetology. So these are uh, essentially a trade school. Okay. And uh, um, I'm sure a lot of what you're saying is very much resonating with them. And um, so what else would you say to a, um, a school audience. Uh, and, you know, ac actually, and I got to be fair, salons and spas, they're, they're, all, they're a school too. Uh, education is part of the DNA of any successful salon or spa. Tell me if you guys agree out there. So you are really talking to a bunch of people that are in the education industry, um, whether it's, whether it's um, traditionally defined that way or not. So what else would you speak to the educators out there? And, well, and, and, I'm speaking... Mm -hmm. creativity and financial literacy, and then I'll be quiet here. Sure. Well, I'm speaking to my people because <laughs> I'm an educator by, by trade. So it, you know, going back to my Angela's word, when you give, um, when you get give, when you learn, teach, you know, and a true educator ha has that sacrifice of of transferring information. And that's why creativity development is so important. And especially with financial literacy, because if you look about in the book that um, I, I sent you from debt to, to destiny, creating financial freedom from the inside out, that's the, the title. Money is so emotional, right? There's your emotional con connection. So if you're trying to educate someone in their craft, whatever the craft is, or in financial literacy, you we have to be mindful of the psychological experiences and the cultural cues. You know, some people, I call it the dinner ta table lessons. Some people had these financial lessons at the dinner table growing up, a lot of us didn't. And then when you add in stats about um, women, right? Women living longer, women um, divorcing more than they did 40, 50 year, years ago. So they need more money saved up to last a longer time. And then if you talk, talk about people of color and there are all the stats around that, you're, there's so many, element at, at play. And so to be a good educator, and this is what has helped me in my craft, is that creativity piece. When I'm when I meet when I met you and you're talking to me about your story, Tom, my brain, my subconscious brain was quickly moving things around and connecting and and a talk I heard five years ago came up and then a documentary I watched two years ago came up and then something I read last week came up as I'm talking to you because my brain's trying to fit this together saying, how can I relate best to Tom so we can start speaking the same language? Don't forget the brain learns not by stuffing new information into it. The brain learns through integration. We need to understand what you know, and then I bring in new information and integrate it with what you already know. That's why educators, good educators are very good with metaphorical thinking, using metaphors, using stories, because the brain is wired for stories. And so if you look, saw at the series business, 
conference, um, there's a lot of stories, you know, weaved in, but even the avocado story, do you remember that, that one? Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't even plan on saying that. That was not a part of my notes for that keynote, but I was up there and I saw their faces. I was connecting with them and something in my heart said avocado. And so I just went for it. And Tom, like, 15 people walked up and told me how that story was a light bulb moment for them. And so a true educator knows how to dance. You know the choreography of the lesson, but if improvisation comes up, you got to know how, how to move. You see, I'm just using a metaphor of dancing for any of you guys who have a dance background, but it, it's a salsa. You have to, you have to know when you're about to turn and if the if the rhythm changes on you like it did with this the pandemic you you have to to be like you said in the opening be adaptable and be flexible and know how to fox trot even though you started in as a waltz and it may end up on a salsa we don't know but because you're tooled now in these creative thinking tools you now can pivot and switch when you have to good educators have that in their tool belt and they know how to teach that to their students are you familiar with uh, uh, Julia Cameron and the Artist's Way? I uh, don't, but I will. The Artist's Way. It's a, it's a spiritual guide to creativity, and mm -hmm. it's a seminal work on creativity. And um, one of the things at the very beginning, one of her core concepts is uh, the concept of a shadow artist. Uh, and a shadow artist is someone that kind of is a creative wannabe that sort of lives in the shadow of other artists, you know? And um, usually finance and creativity don't match well together. You know what I mean? In terms of they're, they're, the, 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 uh, the common understanding is their you know, accounts aren't creative, you know, for example. That was a big <laughs> journey for me. And I literally needed to become an artist in order to learn design and visual communication. And um, so you know, we all have creative people. It was interesting, a lot of creative people maybe feel like they want to be better with money and a lot of money people want to maybe be a little bit more creative you know um comments about yeah. that yes well my ted talk talks about that so if anyone wants to go watch the ted talk um just my name and ted talk and you'll see my 16 minutes about that but i will quickly say um in in the book um the seven, seven gems i actually bring up accountants right because when you think of Sadly, the profession that has been, you know, labeled the non-creative profession, you think of like accountants and CPAs, and right? And I talk about that in the book about how accountants have to be our most, most creative because we have IA that can do the numbers. You know, we have um, technology that, that can do the original, you know, that accountant with, with the rainbow visor and the, mm -hmm. with the 10 key calculator in the corner. I mean, that's not the image that we see now. And um, on my podcast, the Create and Grow podcast, I think episode two or, th or three, I interview an, an accountant and she says, people are so surprised when I tell them that I, I'm an accountant because I'm so creative and she's so artistic as well that it's not meshing in their bias of what accountants should look like. And so because now she said, I'm getting promoted so often because my man, my leaders see that these other soft, I don't really call them soft skills, but these other critical life skills are so advanced in her. She's very, very connects well with, with people. And for those accounts that they have, they needed people who knew how to connect well with people. She's a great storyteller. Uh, she, she's a dancer and she is very, just looks at things differently. Yes, she knows the numbers. Yes, she can you know crunch on a 10 key, but she's also out there. She's highly culturally comp competent and highly artistically creative as well. And that adds into the fact that she knows her numbers. And so for the accountants and all of these originally non-creative non scene jobs, which now we know are creative, you're, this decade, you're going to see a huge shift that the people who are now going to be in demand are the people who have these critical, creative, um, and culturally competent skills in place because AI can do what you did 50 year, years ago. We need people to be able to think. Yeah, we've, we had uh, one of the episodes, we, we've had multiple episodes with CFOs and um, we've talked about what the new CFO is. The new CFO mm -hmm. definitely needs to be able to think creatively and to be able to connect dots. Cause you're right with artificial intelligence and 
um, um, outsourced labor and all that kind of stuff. The, you know, a lot of the skills that really relate to accounting and finance uh, become a commodity, but creativity is not. So um, I'm looking at the clock and I could talk to you the rest of the day, but you didn't sign up for that, <laughs> nor did the people on this call. And so at some point, all great things must start coming to an end. No, and, Tom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this we, we've had now multiple conversations. Thanks again to Carol. And um, so this is not the end of our conversation. I'd love to have you back as a guest one of these times. I'm here. I'm an educator. So I love, love to help uh, spark these light bulb mo moments. And we're certainly, um, whether we have you participate in the fill or not, which you and I are talking about, see if we can make that work. We certainly hope to see you on the Sunday night to at least celebrate you being a member of our brain trust. So at a minimum, <laughs> we'd love to see a Sunday night, May 15th, so everybody could meet you in person. Um, and then we're going to actually see if we can make you part of the event. So, um, yes. well, I will, as long as I can bring my brain into the brain trust, I will, will be, be there. <laughs> you, you can, you can, you can bring your brain and you can bring your husband too. Yeah. So, <laughs> awesome. All right. Now, uh, let me, uh, award you the a million dollar light bulb. Okay. So, oh, uh, awesome. official welcome to the brain trust. It. Uh, it will come in a box that looks like this. Uh, whoops, I'm upside down. So uh, let's everybody give uh, Janine a virtual round of applause. Awesome. What a great session. So Janine, let's, um, um, let's connect very soon. Uh, watch for your light bulb in the mail and we'll be talking to you about Arizona. I'll be in Arizona next week, by the way, and i um, getting a little sunshine. So, um, yes, awesome. but thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you so much. Go out and be creative. Your creative health affects your financial wealth. So be creative today. Say that one more time. Your creative health affects your financial wealth. So be creative today. I love it. All right. Let me see who's on the call today. Who do we got? Uh, Andrew. Andrew, I believe, is a CPA. Hey, Andrew. And Ann and Anna and April. April's a CPA. She was wanting to know if she's a cool one or not. Of course you are. Austin from Michigan. Candice from California. Our team. I already mentioned Carol Augusta. Um, I'm probably not going to get to all the names, but I'll go through a bunch of them like Casey and Cheyenne. Cheyenne, I think it's Mark Pardo's birthday today. I don't know if Mark's on the call or not, but if not, say hi to him. Uh, Heather and Jan and Jared. Jared's another CPA. Uh, my good friend Joe from um, uh, Colorado and John's with us. Hey, John. Uh, Jonathan, Carrie, Carrie, Kelly, Kelly, Lisa, Lisa, um, Let Leticia. Uh, Marie from our team, Mark, Megan, Megan's from Arizona too, by the way, she's from Tucson, Megan's awesome, uh, Melissa, Mike's with us, hi Mike from Ohio, glad you joined us, and, and Nina from Pennsylvania, and Sam, and Sarah, Steve, and Sue, and Tamika, uh, Terry, and Terry, Trish, and Vanessa, as well as a few other people from our team, and a few other names I missed, thanks for joining us, let's see what we have in the chat, um, I think what Michelle did was add a few of your points there. We got a lot of different shout outs to you. So check out the shout outs and, um, uh, let and me go back. Connect with, with me on LinkedIn. We share a lot of this research on link, on link, link, LinkedIn. Awesome. And I think we're going to incorporate some of your work into our course, by the way, um, which is, which is awesome. All right. What else do I have for the, for uh, the group today here? Uh, let's see here. Okay. We talked about that mindset. All right. Um, don't forget to register for the fill. We are under early bird registrations. Many of you have already registered, which is awesome. Uh, and, uh, I love this, uh, this little video because this says, <laughs> all right, our money pro is coming soon. Um, we will we do have a gift for you. You can use this QR code to receive monthly lessons in financial literacy. So check that out if you're not already on our mailing list for that. Uh, shout out to our sponsors, Pivot Point, uh, who are our partners in the um, money course for students. Um, so those of you that are schools, uh, we certainly hope you'll become a money school. You can go to cutyforschools.com. Also, uh, shout out to Lightheart Sanders, the CPAs. They um, also uh, have sponsored these roundtables. And if you don't have a coach, get a coach. Uh, contact us. 
uh, for a complimentary discovery session. So uh, closing thoughts, I don't know, I, uh, you know, Janine had me at hello, um, just the topic of creativity and financial literacy and, um, and getting to know her has been a true joy. So one of the best things about this round table is I get to meet really cool people and get to learn from really cool people. And uh, uh, so I guess the closing thought which I've used many times and that is from Oliver Wonder Holmes and that is a mind stretched never returns to its original form. So hopefully your mind was stretched a little bit today. You had some light bulb moments. Uh, we are off next week. Uh, I am uh, off next week working on the course, working on writing. Um, so we're going to take a week off and then we are back together in two weeks, which I think is March 2nd, if my memory serves me right. Um, so be sure to join. We have a great guest. It's already, we already know who it is. You do not want to miss March 2nd. Michelle, would you please type in there as someone? Am I right? It is May, uh, March 2nd, our next episode. So don't miss it. Great guest. Uh, thanks for joining us, you guys. Uh, we will now wrap up and we hope you have a great and a prosperous rest of the week. Bye now. Thanks again.